an LED light, a dead underground LED light. This one comes the story. Douglas says, I got this from an auction in a box of shop returns. It does light, but very dimly. I took it apart to see if it could be salvaged, but it looks like the LEDs have simply failed. I see the black spot of death in each of the chips. The glass had moisture on the inside surface before I opened it, but that doesn't seem to have been the problem. What puzzles me is that each LED chip seems to have a capacitor connected across it. I'm a novice at circuit design, and I simply can't work out why they're there. I'd be interested to hear what you think of it. Okay, right, well, I've initially powered this up and I got a very brief glow from LEDs at low level. Then it just sat there uh, showing 3 milliamps and 0.6 watts. So let's open it up. And for this, because it's, uh, let's see, that's the posi drive. Let's use a proper driver for this because it might be stiff screws. They're not too bad, actually. I'm not a huge fan of uh, ground mounting uplighters, particularly 240 volt ones, because A, they always let water in, uh, and B, they're very dazzling, and C, I'm not a fan of mains voltage stuff at ground level, where voltage gradient can occur. You'd be surprised how many of these lights are just passing current to the ground. I should pop that screwdriver up out of the way. The glass, I think it's had this open. No, it, it oh, actually did that start coming out. There it goes. So this has been filled round with uh, rubber. And I did notice, oop, I did notice that the back, the cable here, has a little clamp, but it's all been potted with resin. So they've gone to effort to try and avoid the, the situation that Underground lights, water can actually travel up the inside of the cable. That's something you should consider if you're ever doing outside stuff. What do we have? We have a meagre five LEDs, but they will be multi-chip LEDs because I also see, let's screw, let's zoom up on this. I also see one of the linear current regulator chips. So we have a fusible resistor. Um, Round black, black gold. So that's a one zero and a zero multiplier. So it's actually 10 ohms, which is pretty common. That's a, incidentally the 10 ohm resistor that just blows your R1, R2 readings out of the water for those who know what I'm talking about. Uh, that's good enough. Is it going to read 10 ohms? Oh. 10 ohms. Do you know what? I discovered something about this meter I've never really thought about. When you're measuring re really low resistances, uh, it takes a while to actually, it takes a wee while to think about it before it actually stabilises. I've never really tweaked that before and I've been going, oh, it's not reading, I've got a bad connection, etc. And it's not, it's just because I'm impatient. Right. Okay, I see what he means by the capacitors. Right, tell you what, I'm going to take a picture of this and then we shall investigate it. I don't know if it's going to be repairable, but you know what's certainly worth investigating. I wonder why they have those capacitors. That's quite odd. Right, I shall reverse engineer this and then we shall explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Let's explore. So there is the main supply coming onto the circuit board. The circuit board, which is, as you'd expect, it's the aluminium substrate, a piece of aluminium with the slight wafer-thin shim of fiberglass circuit board, then the copper on top that everything goes on to provide good thermal coupling into the base. It does have heat sink compound, but it's absolutely bone dry. It looks as though it's been dry for quite some time. Tricky. So it has that circuit board with the mains coming on, and then it goes through that 10 ohm fusible resistor, goes to the metal oxide resistor to clip any high voltage transients and spikes on the supply, gets rectified by this bridge rectifier, there's a little one meg ohm resistor cross here. The purpose of that is to make sure that when you turn it off, the lights don't just dim away gently. It makes them go off decisively. And it also avoids that issue you sometimes get where you've got long switch cable runs that the capacitive coupling on them results in the LEDs just residual glowing when they're supposed to be off. That's common. There is a smoothing capacitor, a rather ungenerous, what is that? 1.8 megfarad at 400 volts. Let's write that on. 1.8 microfarad at 400 volts. Then it goes to this ZX9101HT current regulator, and that has a current regulating uh, resistor here. I think it's typically about 0.6 volts is the reference. Let's work that out. I 
equals the V over R. So that's the 0.6 volts it's looking for across that resistor, divided by the resistance, which is 33 ohms. They were aiming for about 18 milliamps. Now, the LEDs, that's kind of expectable, but it's pushing the LEDs quite hard. There are five LEDs, which I'd normally expect to be dropping over about... 200 volts because this is a turn of water full supply this is a this capacitor would theoretically charge up to the 330 volt mark uh, and then this is going to be whatever the leds don't drop when this current regulates it's going to actually be dissipating it itself and what happens with these chips here is they regulate the current but they dissipate it like a resistor they get hot but if they get above a certain temperature they will actually self-regulate down so the current will gradually decrease uh, which protects leds against overheating as well supposedly there are indeed capacitors across all the leds now it's worth mentioning that if this was a chinese design the leds would have been on huge big wedge shaped copper you know they'd have just basically shaped it for maximum heat dissipation to cover as much of that area as possible. In this case, they're just relying on fairly small contact. I mean, the pads are chunky-ish, but they're relying on fairly small areas to actually couple that thermally through the fiberglass onto the aluminium at the back. You can see the slight dots in these where the bond wires are on, where they've basically failed. Now, I'll bring in the schematic. The schematic is more or less what I've just described. And I shall zoom down just a little bit more. So there's the supply coming in through the 10 ohm fusible resistor. There's the metal oxide resistor. It's an O7D471K. That means 7 millimeter diameter. The D is a disc uh, metal oxide resistor. 471 is its voltage rating. In this case, 47 and a multiplier of 1. So 1 zero at the end, 470 volts. What that means is that typically... During testing, they will rate it by the voltage at which they just start conducting a very tiny amount of current, something like one milliamp, and that's their voltage rating. And then K is the tolerance in that. A standard bridge rectifier, the capacitor, I did nip off the one mega ohm resistor and I measured the capacitance, 1.48 is what it came in at. There's that discharge resistor. And then there's the simple regulator circuit, the ZX9101HT. I reckon that these might be 12 chip LEDs, which means they're going to be dissipating a lot of heat and they're probably going to be about 40 volts each. With those that are 4.5, I'd guess actually 4.7 plus tolerance, nano-fired capacitors across them. Now, mixed thoughts. Maybe they're for interference suppression, maybe to protect the capacitors against voltage spikes or... Maybe they've deliberately used 50 volt capacitors on the basis that if an LED went open circuit, the capacitor would then see the open circuit voltage, which would be almost 350 volts, and it might actually fail short circuit. This is just a guess, and maybe bridge the LED and keep it on. Not really sure. That's the two possibilities. It certainly didn't bridge in this instance, because if it had bridged, it would have basically, this chip here would have been dissipating all that power, the, the full 350 volts at its rated current, which would have been a lot of power. What is that then? Uh, 18 milliamps, let's uh, go for, it would have been about, say, 330 volts uh, times 0 0.018, 5 watts, say 6 watts. So 5 or 6 watts for this LED. I'm guessing they'll probably run those LEDs at 1 watt each. But uh, here's a perfect opportunity to try something. I recently took a look at a heating controller and these capacitors are really hard to desolder. Apparently the technique is to, I think it's Mr. Carlson's lab, is to grab the capacitor and pushing it onto the circuit board, twist it. Oh, it works. Oh, look at that. It worked. It actually sheared the leads where they go on and now they can be desoldered. Oh, that worked a treat. Oh, that's a good tip. Thanks, Mr. Carlson's lab. I think it was Mr. Carlson's lab. And thanks to those of you who mentioned that. Right, that's a handy tip to know because that does make it so much easier to desolder these. So now we've, uh, now we've done that. What can you do to fix the light? Well, it's a dedicated circuit board. A circuit board that was destined to fail, but there are things you could do. For instance... You could turn it into a pink up light. 
I have left the reflector out here for reasons. It could still be fitted, but it would be a bit trickier. But uh, this is more decorative. This is only one watt now, and that's going to stay super cool. And I'll show you what I've done here to do this. The reason it's pink is, well, A, it's the channel's official colour, and also, uh, that's the first LED I found was a pink one. So if I unscrew the cover on this, and you'd have to do all the waterproofing as well. I should also mention, I'll give you a clue, the voltage rating is now just 3 or 4 volts. At 350 milliamps, 3.27 volts apparently, at 350 milliamps. What have I got inside? Let's zoom down on this. So what I've done is, I'm going to turn that off, that's better. I've mounted a standard 1 or 3 watt LED in there by drilling a couple of holes. The two holes, unfortunately, they are going to break through the case. I'm not sure if you'll see them, you won't see them. Let's shine a light down, you'll see the end of the screws down there. Uh, so that kind of defeats the waterproofing a bit. I also had to use fibre washers between the screws and the LED to actually stop it bridging contacts, but I usually do that anyway. Um, and ultimately that means you can put a standard LED in. This does mean you're going to have to find a way to get the residual compound of this out. Uh, where is a flat blade driver? I'm sure I had a flat blade driver here. I have misplaced my flat, there it is. It's a different colour from normal, that's why I didn't see it. I suppose you could dig all this out and you could repot it. I'm not sure this would be a good idea or not. If you're mounting it under, if you're mounting it outdoors, then it'd have to be waterproof. You know what? The other thing you could do with this is you could actually just fill it up with the gel, the polymer gel, but that would be kind of expensive and it would also still get water in. I'm not sure the best bet there for sealing that. But uh, you can fix it. You can uh, put a standard 1 or 3 watt LED in this and just connect the live and neutral wires as positive and negative. And then you could either use one of these shonky little... Uh, Power supplies. Actually, you know what? I bet you could actually get the circuit board out of this and fit it in the side. This is probably not recommended. You could do what a lot of the Chinese manufacturers do, and they just put a bit of heat shrink on it and then just stuff it inside. Yeah, that would be very messy. That would be so hot. That's not a great idea. Don't do that. Uh, you could get one of these supplies, but never trust these little transformers as being properly isolated. You'd have to make sure it was earth. It would be better to actually adapt it. Just run the whole lot at low voltage. You could also, if you wanted to run these at a higher voltage, like 5 volts, you could put the resistor inside. There's plenty of stuff. You could, Siliconing it down could actually provide the heat dissipation locally to regulate the current down to the LED. But uh, you can salvage them so it doesn't become landfill if you wish. Just depends if you want to or not. Uh, but there we go. <clears throat> Interesting stuff. Very common failure. I wonder how many of these just get put into landfill. Uh, notable things that are good. The fact that they took the cable in. And instead of actually just popping the cable directly in here and then blobbing silicon around it like they often do, they've actually put the, they've potted it in this resin here so that it actually is completely waterproof and water can't sneak down inside the cable to get in there. So it looks as though they made at least some effort to do a decent job. Uh, it would have been nice to see a higher value resistor there, so this ran at a much lower power, like just 2 or 3 watts, but they, they obviously wanted a dazzling light in the ground to leave a big skid mark up the side of a building or just dazzle people. If you look around cities, you'll find they're full of these uplighters in the pavements and they're not lit or they're still glowing dimly because and you can see droplets of water inside. And uh, all those things are an electrical hazard, such is the nature of architects. Let's, let's implant, implement, implement, implant mains voltage electrical stuff into the ground everywhere where people are walking, dogs are walking, things like that. It's a great idea. But uh, there we go. Interesting stuff. Well worth taking to bits. So uh, thank you to Douglas for sending that. It was quite fun to take apart and indeed to repair.